All right, guys, chapter 26, problem 12. It says two 10 centimeter diameter charged rings face each other 20 centimeters apart. Both rings are charged to plus 20 nanocoulombs. What is the electric field strength at A, the midpoint between the two rings, and B, the center of the left ring? So let's start with a sketch here. Here is the axis that's going to combine the two rings, and here is ring number one. Here is ring number two. And the problem says that they are 20 centimeters apart. And they have a radius, which I'm going to call big R, which is equal to 10 centimeters. And we're asked to find the electric field in part A right here in the center, and in part B at the center of the left ring. So the first part of this problem is really just examining the symmetry of this setup um, and seeing uh, what we can deduce just from the symmetry of the problem. And when we're looking at the electric field here in the center, uh, we want to think about how we're going to calculate that electric field. And what we'll do is take this continuous charge that's around this ring and split it into a bunch of tiny little dq charges and sum them up around the ring. And we'll repeat that procedure on the other ring over here. But um, since they both have identical charges here of 20 nanocoulombs um, smeared around this ring and 20 nanocoulombs around this ring, um, and they're both positive and we're the same distance from each ring, we're right here in the center, we can see by symmetry here that if we look at a charge dq, it's going to emit an electric field that points towards A. And on the other side, we're going to have, if we continue that through, we'll see that there's another charge dq on the other ring um, that joins that same line and it is going to emit an electric field that from the charge dq to the point a and these guys are going to create electric field components that are equal and opposite and since we have total symmetry in this problem we have two identical rings at two identical distances it doesn't matter where we choose a point on the ring um, it's going to uh, have a point on the other ring that cancels out the components of the electric field so by symmetry we can say at point a that the electric field contribution from both rings is equal and opposite. Therefore, the net electric field is zero. All right, so part A is pretty easy. We don't actually have to do a calculation there. We can just conclude from symmetry that the electric field must in fact be zero. Now, point B is at the center of this ring over here. So if we were to draw um, an X and a Y axis here on this ring, uh, we're gonna have a contribution from uh, to the electric field at this point uh, from the far ring over here. We're gonna have all of these points that add up around the ring here. And we're also going to have an electric field contribution from the close ring. Now, uh, the electric field contribution here, if we choose a little piece uh, dq right here, it's going to emit an electric field that points away from that little charge dq. And as we go around the ring, we're going to have electric field components that point in every direction around the ring. And once again, we're going to be going, uh, we're going to have electric field components that point up just as often as we have electric field components that point down. This is a circle after all. We're going to have the same contribution to the left and to the right. So at point B, the contribution due to this left ring here is equal to zero. So really, at point B, we only have an electric field contribution due to the far ring. So part B, we've simplified this problem from a two ring setup to really just uh, calculating the electric field due to a charged ring at a distance um, of 20 centimeters away from its center. So that's the problem that we're going to look at in part B. This is uh, similar to the example problem in the book, um, if you want to follow along there, but I want to just provide this problem with full detail and explanation for you guys. So uh, I'm going to rotate our coordinate system just to make it a little bit easier to draw here. So we have a ring, we have an axis going through the center of the ring, and <clears throat> we'll call this the z-axis here, and we can draw a x-axis and a y-axis, 
and then we have the z-axis over here. And we want to consider a point along the z-axis here um, for calculating the electric field. And this distance from the center of the ring is going to be 20 centimeters. And I just want to be clear, I'm drawing this pointing out of the page to the right here just because it's easier to draw that in perspective. I'm still talking about the electric field of this ring here. It doesn't matter which way uh, we draw it. We're just, you know, looking around from the other side here um, in our view. And I don't, want to, I don't want you to think that I'm actually calculating the field due to this left ring here. So um, <clears throat> this is our point P that we're interested in. And we want to add up all the little charges DQ um, which create an electric field contribution. So from this little DQ that I've drawn here, it's going to emit an electric field that points directly out from that charge towards, towards our point of interest. And as we integrate around this ring here, um, this line here that I've drawn is going to sweep out a cone. And so we're going to get a cone of electric field here. And once again, the components that point up are going to be the same as the components that point down. The components to the left are going to be the same as the components that point to the right. So as we integrate all around here, the x and y components are going to cancel, and the net electric field is just going to point in the z direction. So explicitly, I can write that our little electric field piece is going to be equal to some electric field component in the x direction. Uh, times i hat plus some electric field in the y direction times j hat plus some electric field in the z direction times k hat and by symmetry we can say that these two components are going to be equal to zero. So that means whatever electric field we end up with is just going to be equal to that z component of the electric field times the k hat piece. So now we need to figure out what that z component of the electric field is going to look like here. Okay, so this distance from the center of the ring to the point of interest along the z-axis, this is going to be our coordinate z. And the distance from um, this side of this triangle here, uh, from the origin to the point on the ring that we're interested, that has a length of r, big R, which is the radius of the circle. And this distance here from the point of interest, I mean from the charge to the point of interest here, this is going to be the square root of z squared plus r squared. And we can go ahead and put an angle theta in here as well. And if this is our angle theta, then this is also our angle theta. And this DE piece can be broken up into a piece that points along the z axis and another piece that involves x and y components here. And we're only interested in this z piece, which is adjacent to our angle theta in this case. So the electric field of a point charge is given by, or an infinitesimal point charge is given by k times dq divided by r squared. And once again, r is not the radius of anything. It's the distance from the charge that we're integrating to the point of interest. And so if we want to get the entire um, circle here, we're going to need to go all the way around in a circle, and so let's go ahead and define our angle in the conventional way here from the x-axis. I'm gonna, we've already used theta, so uh, our integration angle here is going to be equal to phi. Put an arrow on here. This angle is phi. So um, we said here when we were resolving this in components that the piece that points along the z-axis is going to be uh, times the cosine of theta. So we can say that dEz is going to be equal to dE times the cosine of theta, which is equal to k times dQ over r squared times the cosine of theta. And we can write our cosine of theta here in terms of some known variables here. The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, so that's going to be our parameter z uh, over the hypotenuse, which is the square root of z squared plus r squared. So this is equal to k times dq divided by r squared times the cosine of theta, which is going to be z over the square root of z squared plus r squared. All right.
We're also, we need also to get rid of these other dependent variables, r squared and dq here, so we can go ahead and do our integration. So r squared is easy. That's just the distance from our infinitesimal charge to the point of interest. So that's going to be uh, the square root of z squared plus r squared, all squared down here on the bottom. So we get that dez is equal to k times z times dq divided by z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power. And the last thing we need to do is get rid of dq. So dq is going to be, and I apologize, I am switching between lowercase and uppercase. I need to get on top of that. q is q in this case, and my notation is just a little bit sloppy. My apologies. So dq here, um, we can write in terms of the linear charge density. It's going to be equal to k times z times lambda times the a little piece of length. So our charge dq here occupies a little bit of arc length here on the circle. So we need to get an infinitesimal piece of arc length here. It's not just d theta or d phi in this case. It's not just d phi because d phi times lambda does not have units of charge. We're replacing a dq here. So we need to have units of charge here. And d phi uh, does not have units of length. It's dimensionless since it's an angle. So a little bit of arc length here. So the expression for arc length, as you may recall, is equal to the radius of the circle times the angle uh, that you're interested in. The way that I always remember this is that we know that a circumference is equal to 2 pi times r. And two, there's 2 pi radians in a circle. So the circumference is just the arc length of a total circle. But in our case, we're not looking at an angle of 2 pi. We're not even looking at an angle of theta. We're just looking at a little tiny angle d phi. So in order to have a little piece of arc length here, we can replace dq with lambda times that little piece of arc length, which is going to be r times d phi. All right, so we can go ahead and plug that back into our expression. So we're going to get that the infinitesimal electric field in the z direction is equal to k times z times lambda times r times d phi divided by z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power. And now we're ready to integrate. We can get that the integral of dez is going to be equal to ez, the electric field in the z direction, which is going to be equal to the integral of k times z times lambda times r times d phi divided by z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power. And we've defined phi as being counterclockwise from the x-axis, so this is just our conventional unit circle uh, angular parameter, and we're going to take that all the way around the circle from 0 to 2 pi. So this is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Now we're in pretty good shape here because our integral here depends on phi. And all of our other variables in this equation are constant in, with the angle phi. k is the, the electric constant. z is the distance that we're out from the ring. Um, that doesn't change. Lambda is the charge density of the ring. r is the radius of the ring. So all of these parameters are constant. So this simplifies quite nicely to k times z times lambda times r over z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power, uh, all times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d phi. Great. So the integral of d phi is just equal to phi evaluated from 2 pi from 0 to 2 pi is just going to give us a factor of 2 pi there. So this is all equal to 2 pi times k times z times lambda times r divided by z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power. And lambda is not given in the problem, but we're given the total charge here. So lambda, as you recall, is defined as the total charge on the wire divided by the length of the wire. So in our case, it's going to be the total charge on the wire divided by 2 pi times r, which is the circumference of the ring. So we can plug that in here for lambda. And we're going to end up with a 2 pi easy is equal to 2 pi uh, times k times z 
times r, and then we have our lambda here, which gives us a big Q on top, and then divided by 2 pi r, that's the denominator here from lambda, times z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power. And the two pi's are going to cancel, and the r's are going to cancel. And we end up with the electric field in the z direction is just equal to k times z <coughs> times q divided by z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power. Okay, all that's left then is to plug in some numbers for this problem so we can get a numeric answer. And returning to our original picture here, r is given to be 10 centimeters. Uh, the distance from our ring to the point of interest, that's 20 centimeters. Um, we can choose positive z points into the page in this direction, so we'll end up with a, a positive sign there. Um, and we have our total charge is 20 nanocoulombs. Um, so I think that's all we're going to need to solve this problem. So plugging that all in, we get that E, the total electric field is just equal to the electric field in the z direction times k hat, which is going to be equal to 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared times z, which is the distance uh, from the origin to our point of interest, which is 20 centimeters in this problem, 0 0.2 meters, times the total charge Q, which is given as 20 nanocoulombs, 20 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs, all divided by z squared, which is going to be 0 0.2 meters squared, plus r squared, um, and the radius of the circle is given to be 10 centimeters, so that's 0 0.1 meters, all squared. This whole denominator gets raised to the 3 halves power, and we still have our k hat vector out here. And so this is going to give us a value of the total electric field being equal to uh, 4.1 times 10 to the 3 newtons per coulomb in the k hat direction. And to be clear, we've chosen z to point uh, into the page here, so that's, you know, if we were to rotate this view, that's to the left. So our net electric field here points in this direction uh, from this charge distribution here. Once again, the ring that's surrounding this point B does not contribute to the electric field at all because all of the components cancel. And so our net electric field is equal to 4.1 times 10 to the 3 newtons per coulomb.